Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to You've Championed Yourself, Who Are You? I'm Chris Ferguson, your host, and it has been a dream of mine for years to showcase ordinary people doing extraordinary things for themselves and for others. Those who have taken their dreams and their ideas and turned it into their reality. As they reach beyond their personal struggles, their pain and their traumas, where so many people give up and they lose hope. But these people don't. These people, there are the few that can walk through their obstacles to go beyond their challenges. They don't know where it's going to take them. They just know enough to trust themselves and not to give up. They do the follow through in their personal life, their career, and in relationships. And this is what I call a champion in life. Today, I have an amazing young lady with me. Her name is Leigh Moore, and I'd like to welcome her to the podcast. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to serve my people this way. Well, I'm, I'm so glad because the thing is, is your topic, I love talking about topics that people don't talk about. Because the fact is, is the more we talk about them, the more people understand how, how to become more tolerant, how to become more understanding and compassionate, because they don't know why this person behaves this way. But you know what? Maybe, maybe we should be speaking more mainstream on this than we do currently. So yes. that's my opinion, just my opinion. And that's my message to get. And that's why I created this podcast is to get people who are stepping out and stepping up for knowledge and education and helping people to understand. So I thank you for that. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're so welcome. You're so welcome. Um, Lay. Let's talk about your backstory, where where the things you went through to get you where you are now and why you're doing it. Can we do that? Sure. I, I never thought I was all that unusual. Um, I, I do know now that basically my entire family was on the spectrum somewhere. Um, I also understand that that spectrum, that we're all on it somewhere. And well, let's, let's start out. We're talking about ADHD spectrum. Yes. Sorry okay. about that. No, 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 that's good. That's good. But I, but I love the way you started it, but it's like, okay, my audience is, is listening to this and they're going, what kind of spectrum? What kind of spectrum? So no, please, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but if you could, if you could talk and let everybody know it is the ADHD spectrum and how. And, and that was a perfect ADHD moment. Um, sorry <laughs> about that. You're all right. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. I love it. And, and so we, all of us, were a little bit, uh, we had our little differences. And it was back, I was a kid before ADHD, ADD, any of these things were even a thing. Mm -hmm. And so our parents just said, you're smart kids, you'll figure it out, which didn't really help us a whole lot. Since then, they've had the diagnoses and they've come up with methods to help people. And now we're back to a part where we're not going to label the kids, but at least we have some methods to help people figure things out, which would have been, I think, a lot. It would have made my childhood and all of our childhoods a little more, uh, a little easier, a little less stressful. Hmm we would have actually understood there was something about us and there was something that we could could do or you know at least accept ourselves better one of the issues with a lot of people who are somewhere on the spectrum is especially in childhood they get a very low self image because they're different and they don't understand why and why can't i be like everyone else why can't i just why can't i just and it really becomes part of a depressive cycle and uh, can be very harmful to the person's life and that can be very harmful to their relationships. I, I get that. Um, the thing is, is to, to go back to what you first said, that they don't want to label any kids with being ADHD, but they'll put them on the spectrum as possibly ADHD. And, the, and I find this with children they do this in other areas. I'm a criminal profiler and 
they won't even label a juvenile, even though they have the behaviors and they're doing the, the acts that a sociopath or psychopath would do, they will not label them as a sociopath or psychopath until after they hit 18, 19, even sometimes 20. And how many, how many things could we prevent if one psychiatrist says, no, they show this, you know, disconnected behavior in them. We're not labeling them as it, but we're saying these are precursors and document them. We could prevent a lot of these disassociation behaviors once they become 20, 21 and 22 and go out and commit crimes of, you know, serial killing or school shootings. I don't think that we're looking at it in the right perspective. Does that make sense? It does. And with all of the methods and tools that we have available now to help kids from a very early age, that would be, you know, why not nip it in the bud? Why not treat it when it's still treatable before it gets to be really entrained? Well, I think just the flip side of this, I think they want to make sure that before they label something that's going to be on their record for the rest of their life, they want to make sure that it is that and it's not just um, a bad behavior they're displaying because they're upset about something else. And it it's a momentary thing and not a permanent thing. So in because I'm an RBT in the uh, you know ADH spectrum, the fact is is that I know that it's they're they're getting more out there. But could they do more? Absolutely. But again, it's what society will accept and what society norms we can get past. Sure. And I have a friend whose family is uh, on the spectrum and her son is on the spectrum, but not listed. She didn't want to have any labels on it, but because she knows because of her family past, she knows the tools, she knows the methods. She's been raising him with all of these tools and methods. And he's doing very well becoming an adult in a normal way. Um, right. He has his slight differences, but he knows how to deal with them. And that's, I think the ideal is, is to make sure the tools and the methods are out there so that people can use them without feeling like there's a stigma attached to them. Well, I think anytime, and especially in this, we've been labeling people for years and that's unfortunate. And I think because of what has happened in the past and now because of all this social change and acceptance, they don't want to um, label anybody else more. I, not an excuse, I'm just a reality. And luckily for this kid, his mom evidently knew that learned the techniques that could help him and put it in place. But a lot of parents, I, I've seen parents who didn't want their children on the on the spectrum, but they never did anything to help them learn. And which created a whole nother time bomb when you talk about the educational system, when you talk about social behaviors, when you talk about the the, the type of processes that they do in their head, it does the dots no, don't normally connect in the same way as it would somebody else. Absolutely. And I can do it from my own family if I compare my friend's son to someone of the younger generation in my own family who they never did. They did exactly what you said. They didn't want it labeled. They didn't want it, you know, they didn't want it mentioned at all. And the, the difference between the two is my friend's son is going to be a functional adult. Mm -hmm. the, the other kids in my family who haven't been listed are having a great difficulty right now. A lot of anger issues, a lot of, of integration with society issues, and I'm very concerned for them. But they will, they, they wouldn't. Uh, when I mentioned that maybe there were some tools that they could use, they outcasted me like I was a witch. <laughs> I'm not laughing at you, but how come when somebody comes up with an idea that is scientifically proven because they don't have the knowledge, you're the problem or you're the word or you're this, you know, you're practicing some kind of magic here going on instead of understanding that we have evolved in the spectrum. 
And the truth was, I have a teaching background. I have a master's degree in education and communication. And I knew what I was talking about. I'd seen these things in, school, in the classroom. And, and still, it was like, you must hate, your, hate these children that are in your family. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that old saying, and I, I grew up hearing this out in, out in Colorado and Wyoming, and, and that is, you can, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Yes. Yes. And the thing is, is sometimes, and I found this out personally with adults who have children with ADHD, blame themselves. So if they admit their child has a problem, that means they gave the child a problem and nobody wants to say, oh man, it's my fault. Or they, they don't want to admit it's my fault or I had a part in it and it's not their fault. It's just life happens. And as I said, you know, it's a spectrum. Every one of us is on it somewhere. Some are a little higher, some are a little lower. I have yet to meet a single person out there who does not have at least one ADHD tendency. But there's a difference between tendency and actually having ADHD, I think. And that just proves my point as far as labeling, because is it a learning process for that, that age group? Now, once you get to become an adult, that might be a little more distinctive. Does that make sense? Sure. And, and I'm not saying that it's not a thing. It is an issue. And for those who are a little higher on the spectrum, they definitely need the tools and the methods to be able to work with it. Absolutely. Yeah. But if we all understood that we all are there somewhere, it would make it a whole lot less of a stig stigma for those who are a little bit higher on the spectrum. Well, I absolutely. Think that, I mean... I use methods every single day because I know I'm somewhere there. And that's how we manage to get through life is by no matter what our challenges are, we have to face our challenges and we have to figure out how to deal with them. Some people know their challenges a little more than others do. Well, not only that, but a lot who wants, how many people really face their fears and, and that aren't on the spectrum? Let's just do that comparison, you know? So the things is, is that with the, the, the let's talk about the ADHD spectrum, because I don't think my, my audience is familiar with the spectrum itself and understanding it. And there are different categories and different processes for different symptoms on the spectrum. Absolutely. And the spectrum can be anything from, um, I have a, a simple issue with, I don't say the right words all the time. Okay, how many of us do that? <laughs> I'm transparent. Um, or, or it could be, it could be somewhere a little bit further along, like I simply have a great difficulty trying to organize anything. Well, no, well, I'm, really I'm an overachiever for organizational skills. I, you yeah, know, yeah. but I, I get your point. The thing is, is, and it's also attention. It's also focusing. It's also yes. trying to uh, have that perspective that can connect to everybody else's perspective. And that's where sometimes the neurons don't connect. Yes. And, and it can go all the way up to where, you know, they have extreme difficulty communicating mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the, that it's, it becomes a, a point where they really need to have the tools, they need to have the help so that they can actually function in society. And that's not necessarily something that's their, I mean, it's not their fault. It's definitely not something that they chose, but it is something that is real for them and they need to be able to deal with it. And they're the people around them you know, when they're kids, their parents, as they get older, their partners, all of these people need to be able to figure out how to deal with these particular ways in which it manifests in each person, which is different from person to person. And, in, and it is, and it's different on each spectrum because one, one spectrum identifies one issue, it, it, it actually connects to another section of the spectrum and another spectrum. And so you could be on five different categories at the same time sure. in those different spectrums. Sure. I know of a lot of people who are not only ADHD, but also have autism. 
Absolutely. And that's an, that's a whole nother story and a whole nother rabbit hole because autism is an amazing, it's, it's beautiful. And well, that's where we came up with the gifted program in the education system is to help those kids that are, are pretty much genius, but they're not connecting to the dots. And those people are the ones who actually work better with technology than some of us like me. <laughs> now, now, please, I, you can't get personal with me on this because I, I am an idiot with technology. I did me and technology are not friends. I, I've struggled to have a, a decent relationship with them. <laughs> well, at least you're trying. I gave up years ago for trying. I'm just saying, like, it's it, it's one of those love hate things. And if my husband had made my computer idiot proof. I would have been SOL. I'm just saying, you know, I, I, I'm i okay with that. It's not my strong point, but I'm grateful I have somebody that can help me out. <laughs> yes. And and I along those lines, but a little bit further along those lines, I ha had a, I, I was given, I, I got a message a little while back and I'm like, well, if autism and ADHD, if all of these spectrum things have been around for a long time before we humans decided to, to figure them out. Where did they start? And I started to think about this and process this. And the, the, the what came into my head was, it started with the original humans way, way, way back. Who... It's been around forever. It's just, these are the, these kids that were on the autism spectrum that didn't exist at the time, they filled up mental, mental hospitals. They, they did, and they didn't need to, because if, if we look all the way back to those original people, the point of having this, uh, how, why was it invented in humans? Why did it become a, a, why did it even exist? Was because humans back then had to be able to think on several different layers at any one time, levels, and be able to see things in a different way for survival. Mm -hmm. These, well, these about people are not abnormal. They are normal. Think about it this way. When you think about, and I, I, I'm not going to say we're all animals, but we're all beings of this planet. And so when, when the thing is, is when a mother elephant walks away from her baby elephant, there's this instinctive understanding that there's something wrong. And so at that point, they walk away. And so... I believe that's probably not to put it in, in a blatant, you know, low level thing. It's just, I think instead of trying to understand or realizing it's an animalistic behavior, but the fact is, is as humans, we see ourselves as superior. So anybody who doesn't match up, we don't want to label them as being bad or not enough, but we label them being bad or not enough. Well, and I think at this point in the world's history, people who can think differently are necessary, absolutely necessary. <laughs> I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I mean, let's look at some, uh, a billionaire, one that comes to mind that was very different, Richard Branson. He's got a 10th grade education. He had a hard time making, understanding all of this stuff. And now he has 400 businesses. He's a gazillionaire. So let's, let's just say, hmm. I'm not saying he's autistic. I'm not saying he has ADHD. I'm just saying he has some of the identifiers that could be labeled as. Oh, and some of them who who are out there, whether you like them and what they do or not, uh, have done amazing things like Elon Musk, who is very open about having being somewhere on the spectrum. And that's maybe how he managed to think through what he did and create what he has. I, I, th I agree. I, I know he, he's, a, <laughs> it's not for me, he's not out there because I love the fact that he is breaking all the barriers and he's very transparent, but he's still secretive. And it's that secretive. It's like, okay, where is the secretive coming from? Well, you know, what's, what's, what's up his sleeve, you know, and he doesn't got a long sleeve shirt on, but what's up his sleeve, you know, but I agree. The thing is, is, there's so many, we dummy ourselves down to fit in. And so and that's actually people, pushed on us by society and has been for generations. It, it has, but the thing was, is like I said, for years and years and years, instead of trying to, we didn't have psychology understandings 
back 50, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, we didn't have it. And so the thing is, is again, it, it was all about power, control, and greed. And if you if you were a have, you were okay. If you didn't, weren't, you were you weren't okay, and you basically suffered. Yeah. And that was all human beings. But the thing is, is who know, again, who who knew, who knew had you know ADHD? It's just like, you know, which which came first, the chicken or the egg? That's how long it's been around. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Yeah. And I don't think that nature would have given, would have invented such a thing and given it to us if it didn't have a purpose. I agree. I agree. So let's talk about some of the misconceptions of ADHD. Okay. Um, especially as young children in school, they will get mocked and, and bullied because people think they either are, are not smart, maybe they don't talk as well or socialize as well, and therefore they must be stupid. This is not true at all. <laughs> I, I'm not laughing, but I have to tell you a story, a personal story. Um, I grew up in an orphanage and I was so angry in life. I, I went, I was non-auditorial. And the word back then was, are you retarded? Mm -hmm. I just didn't have, I didn't, I didn't want, I didn't want to act or say anything because I had so much anger that I wasn't sure how I was going to explode. Does that make sense? Because so I just quit talking. It was just like, ah, mm. so yeah, I understand the bullying and I understand that kids are unmerciful. Mm -hmm. However, I understand that the bullying starts in the family. And it's how our siblings and our family members treat us. Mm -hmm. And then when their friends are around and they see the family members treating that individual bad, then they start treating that family member's family member bad in front of the family member. And instead of the family member stopping it, he's just giving his friends permission to bully him anywhere, at home, and when he's visiting, when they're visiting, or at school. And no matter where it was learned, it transfers over into the school, into business, into all of all areas of life. And eventually, if the, these people, the bullies, get in relationships, they will probably bully and probably abuse the person that they are in the relationship with, which is not good for the long-term survival of the relationship. And I agree with that, but I also understand that people, even though you've been bullied, and I, I was a... It, my story is just horrific, but the bottom line was, is um, I, if I stayed in victimhood, it was one thing. Or uh, what happens when people are victimized, they become a predator or an oppressor, just like what was done to them. Mm -hmm. And so the thing was, is I had to make a different choice saying, I'm neither one of these, even though bad things have happened to me, I'm, I'm choosing differently. And that Absolutely. was a personal choice. However, it didn't stop, but they didn't, when, when I wouldn't talk, their big thing was like, try to force me to talk. And I still wouldn't talk. I just had nothing to say. I hated myself. I hated my life and I hated where I was. So when that, you eventually not, chose to be the hero as opposed to the victim, or in this case, the shero. And I know I'll take hero. It doesn't matter to me, but I agree with you. So, but the thing was, is back in the day, they didn't come up with, they didn't have any autism spectrums. They didn't have any diagnosis for any of this other than they were special needs. But my grades were so good. How could I be special needs? Even though I don't talk, it means I am understanding what I'm, I'm learning what I and understand it and comprehend it. So Nobody ever asked me what, why. Yeah. We had the same thing. We all had them. And, and I think at some point the teacher said, do you think maybe your children have learning disabilities? Because like I am also, other than just being ADHD, I'm dyslexic and dysgraphic. Mm. Uh, and so I had a lot of trouble learning to read. Well, not learning to read because I could read before I got into kindergarten. But I had a lot, I read at a much slower pace than a lot of people. <clears throat> Excuse me. No, you're fine. I, I can see that because as being dyslexic, you're not seeing the words from right, left to right. You're seeing them from le right to left. 
I'm seeing them jump around all over the place, yeah. like, you know, numbers in particular. I wasn't real good with math. I love science, but I wasn't good with math because the numbers just wouldn't hold still. And so they, they were asking, you know, and uh, I know all of the others, like I had a sister who continually dropped the pencil from her desk just so she could move, you know. Uh, <laughs> and so I don't think teachers really loved us, but <laughs> at the same point in time, we were the best kids in the, in the, the top kids in the class. Right. And, and so um, people were like, are they learning disabled? And at the same time, we were in the gifted program. They can't be learning disabled. They are in the gifted program. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's such a dichotomy and there's so many misunderstandings. But let's talk about the challenges of somebody with ADHD to accomplish simple tasks and, and be able to not get frustrated because of the, whatever their disability is, 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 is usually their downfall. Let me explain this in a way that people will make sense of it. Thanks. When someone who is on the spectrum a little bit higher is given a task, let's just give them a task like uh, cleaning off a desk. This task looks to them like a two-dimensional wall that is higher than they can ever get over, and it goes along all ways. And they're like, we can't get over this wall. There's just no way I can. I mean, so they're going to start trying to climb it and do what they can to try and get over it because they're told they have to do it. And, and they just, they're just so overwhelmed and frustrated with it. What the truth is, though, is if the task is broken down into steps mm -hmm. and the steps broken down into small bites, that wall becomes a staircase and they can get over it and they can do the task. So they but it's it's something that they really need to have them broken down into very small steps. I have a checklist that the IBM company gave to their managers so that their managers could make checklists for people who are a little bit higher on the spectrum and it has tasks it has everyday normal tasks but the the overall task is do housework and this is the kind of thing that someone with adhd is going to be i don't know where to start okay so let's break that down into steps yeah. okay step one do the laundry okay that's a step now let's break it down into small bites right. wash dry put away and this is what IBM was doing to explain, this is how you make a checklist for someone who is a little higher on spectrum. And there are people who are ADHD who are working at IBM, which makes perfect sense as we talked about earlier, are like, yay, thank you, please. Yay, yay, yay. <laughs> <laughs> they finally understand me. But the thing is, is that could even be broken down even, even further. So do, in doing the laundry, it's separating the clothes by mm -hmm. colors and textures. Sure. And then you put it in the washing machine. For certain clothes, you don't put in bleach. You always put in laundry detergent and softener. And then you put, when it's done, you put it in the dryer. And when it's completely dry, you hang them up, fold them up and put them away. And so I agree. It is all about the process and the steps and how far you drill down. And some people need that. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean they're less of a human being or they're less intelligent. It just means like some people, as they become adults and they were never diagnosed with ADHD, um, don't know what their next step is. Mm -hmm. And that's one of their biggest questions. What, what are you going to do? Where are you going to go? I don't know. I don't know what my next step is. And we, if we relate, relate this back to the housework issue, the second part of that that has a lot of ADHD people that people do not understand is that they process things in a way and time that is completely different from a lot of other people. If you give them the task, do housework, they may sit there for what seems like ages and they may look at their phone for ages and they are trying, maybe trying to process, how do I put this into a list in my own head so that I can handle this? And it may look to the rest of the world like they are just completely lazy. And that may or may not be the, pro the, the issue. Mm -hmm. And there becomes an, a, an interesting 
line that is very fine between are they addicted to technology or are they processing? Mm -hmm. And a lot of questions need to be asked to figure that one out and to understand where they are, what they're doing. And they may not be able to tell you. And they may be just, I, I just, I just need to sit here. I just need to do this. I just, you know, they may not be able to tell you I'm processing. Mm -hmm. Or they might not be, they might not feel comfortable to saying, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Because a lot of kids with autism, instead of being, they get very reluctant to tell people they can't figure it out or they're processing it because they're, it's not connecting and they don't know what to say or to do, but they don't want to look um, bad. I, for a better word, or or not smart, and so they say nothing, and people interpret that as something else. They do, and if if you happen to be someone who knows about these kinds of issues, you can understand. Like, okay, if you want to go to the beach over the weekend, you may have to tell your your family, your partner, your whoever, a few days in advance, so they have the time to process to try and figure out. What do I not want to do there? What am I going to need to take with me? How much time am I going to spend on this task or on that task? Or, mm -hmm. or you know, if you're having fun, how, I, what, how am I going to do this? And it just takes time to process that. So, it, yes, it takes away some of the, the, hey, let's go to the beach today kind of thing. But if you do it a couple of days in advance, it's a mm -hmm. whole lot more peaceful for everyone. Well, not only is it peaceful, but it, it, it prevents drama in the moment. It prevents chaos in the moment. And most people don't realize that. Mm -hmm. So that's why, Lay, I am so honored to have you here because I love talking about subjects we need to talk more about and understand more about. So let's talk about self-care for, for people with ADHD because it's a little bit different. People who are not listed on the ADHD spectrum has a hard time doing a uh, uh, self-care for themselves naturally. And not just for themselves, but for their partners, for their family. And, and if you happen to be the parent of, of someone, they're interested in something. Maybe they like to go for walks. Maybe they like to go for bike rides. Maybe they like to go to the park. Whatever it is they like to do, encourage them to do that more with the family, without, you know, Sometimes they just need to sit in a corner. That's not necessarily self-care. Self-care is gonna be something that makes them feel better and helps them feel more, quote, normal, if that's even a thing. But the, the self-care for someone who is on the spectrum is going to be whatever makes them feel good. And, and I've seen so many different variations of this. For some people who are kind of the, the ADHD autism mix, they actually may, depending on, a lot of times they have something that is like a superpower. It might be like math, or for me, I do hyperfocus, which means when I need to do something, a, a task, I go, I mean, I am so laser focused on it that getting me out of it will make me extremely grumpy because it is so hard for me to get into it and get back out of it. But when I'm in it, man, can I get things done? But <laughs> that, that, let's the, talk the about self -care on the end of that is afterwards, I need to rest. You know, <laughs> it's like, well, I, while you were talking, it was like being on a sprint. And when you're on a sprint in life, it, it, it is laser focus and it is, you don't allow distractions. You don't allow anything. That's human beings that are really, really in the moment. And for, for someone on the, uh, who's ADHD, this superpower, it blocks out everything. Their, the entire world disappears and all they can see is whatever it is that they're focused on. And I've seen that one. I've seen this also with people who have a, a strong tendency towards math. When they're doing their math or their computers, they're <laughs> just like, <laughs> I had a teacher in college and she had it. And uh, she would go into this, this hyper focus to plan her lessons and her courses and such. 
And she could spend 24 hours or more without eating, drinking, going to the bathroom, anything, just doing this. And then when she got done, then of course she had to make up time of doing everything else, but she got it done and she got it done in this time frame. And I, but yeah, I, but all of these things that you're talking about, and this is just awareness coming to me right now, there are people that don't even think that that's even attached to an ADHD spectrum. But a it lot is. of people, well, I agree with you, but the fact is, is how many people in the real world get so laser focused in what they're doing that nothing else matters until they get from point A to point Z and it's accomplished. So the fact is, is to bring awareness to everybody else in my audience, have you ever been that laser focused on something? I'm not saying you're ADHD, but I'm just saying your tendencies to be that focused is on an ADHD spectrum. Yes. And Absolutely. so the thing is, is a lot of people that are successful get into that uh, laser focus and they stay on it until they, until they accomplish what their, their goal is at any cost. And so the thing is, is, hmm, I don't know. I'm just saying it's on the ADHD spectrum. And I also know that there's an awfully lot of people now who are at least 30 and sometimes as much as 60 who are now being diagnosed with ADHD, which they've had all their lives. And I think that's an attestment to how far we've come because... When they were when they were kids, it didn't exist. There was no spectrum to be put on. And even even in the labeling at that point, it was like, oh, are you retarded? And now that word's forbidden. Mm -hmm. It's special needs. But the thing is, is nobody back then in, let's say, 50 years ago had any qualms with telling somebody that, you know, they, they must be, you know, mentally retarded. And so the fact is, is you could get labeled very easily. And so there, there's, because of what's happened in the past is why they're apprehensive now. Does, does that make sense? And in and, and putting people on spectrums and giving those labels and tags and stuff like that, because yeah, it, it's, a, it's a fine line. It's just a very fine line. I'm not defending anybody. I'm just, I know that back in the sixties, I was, I, I was 10 years old in 1969. So I lived at a time when people were called that. And I lived at a time and, and kids would get labeled and it wasn't even by other kids. It's not even actually being accepted socially. These were from adults that were supposed to be for your best interest. Sure. And I was there too. And like I said, I know a lot of people now who, and, and I know a lot of people who understand that they probably are on the spectrum somewhere. And they're just like, I've lived without it this long. Why do I need to do anything about it now? <laughs> uh, okay. Or is that an internal denial saying, I don't want to get labeled because look at how badly people are being canceled. How do you cancel a person? I'm just asking. I don't know. I, I'm this old lady that, that, you know, it's like, how do you cancel a living human being? I just don't know how you do that. I don't think you can. We're all interconnected and we're all one. You can't cancel anybody. <laughs> I agree. It was a rhetorical question, but think about it. People are canceling people. It's like, what? You know, um, I'm still walking, breathing, eating, sleeping, going to the bathroom, doing my life. So just because you don't want me in your life, you're going to cancel me. What does that mean? You know what? If you want to walk away, walk. Toodles. Deuces. I could care less. However, the fact is, is you're going to, you're going to cancel me. Uh, okay. Okay. Go figure. Who's got the problem there? I'm just saying. Yeah. yeah. But let's talk about spiritual paths. I, I love this because being an energy healer, I've seen a lot of people on the ADHD spectrum that really resonate with their spiritual path. Mm -hmm. And we all have spiritual paths, uh, whether we know it or admit it or not, we all do. And we all have our challenges 
And all of that, every challenge, every event, everything that happens in our lives is part of our spiritual path. And so if you happen to be someone who has ADHD or something else, you have a little bit more knowledge of one of the challenges on your spiritual path. So if you happen to have had to deal with some of the things that you and I both have dealt with all of our lives, especially from childhood, and you may be coming a little more aware of the, the, the different kinds of ways of thinking or being or working in the world, and especially for people who are along the spectrum somewhere and they're um, maybe a little bit more tendency to hyper and or they're mentally hyper, uh, they undoubtedly are benefiting or could benefit from relaxation techniques, um, yoga, anything that helps with concentration and focus. Um, that could be anywhere even like, you know, certain kinds of music to just to help focus, just like other people, only maybe more so. Maybe this is actually more helpful for them. So just for instance, my spiritual path has yoga, it has meditation, it has 432 hertz music, it has delta wave music, it has, I mean, there's an, a whole like file of things that I do to try and help have more calm, more peace in my life. Isn't that what the the spiritual path is all about is having more calm and more peace, but also more confidence, which people on the spectrum really, really need. And if they can be calmer and they can not necessarily fit in, but at least function better, they're going to have better confidence. And so this whole thing about the, that we're going through in the whole world right now where spiritual paths are becoming mainstream, which they weren't when we were kids. You know that. It was all <laughs> I, I remember when transcendental meditation or, or transcendental, uh, transcentral or whatever it is, TMI um, was out in the 70s. And they're like, oh, this is woo woo. All the psychiatrists and all these people are going, oh my God, oh my gosh, this is off the chain. And then when the doctor started doing it, it was like, oh, well, maybe we'll look at it, you know, because again, society norms. However, the one thing that I used with some kids with autism and ADHD kids is um, mindfulness. And I would take them on a journey, and it usually would take them to do some breathing exercises and talk to them in such a tone of voice that it was calming, it was reassuring, they were safe. And for a lot of kids with ADHD or autism, feeling safe is so important, but they don't have that safe feeling. So in doing, I was gonna ask you, because I do practice mindfulness, and I used to do it live on Facebook every week, just to help get people through the weekend, you know, from Wednesdays to get them through the week because weeks were kind of, we were going through COVID. There was all this crankiness going on and there wasn't anything positive being posted and anything positive for people to get through. So I used, and it was very, very um, rewarding for the kids because it got them through their day. Mm -hmm. And they oh, had that absolutely. break to get out of the head, to take a moment and breathe. And so they weren't a part of anything other than everybody else in the classroom, breathing and relaxing. And that's actually becoming mainstream in classrooms now. I I, I, I really love that it, it is. And I'm so glad that they're op opening it up. But see here in Tennessee, I, I am so impressed with the school system here because the thing is, is you can't quit school until you're 18. You cannot get a GED at 16. You, they're not going to allow you to quit. The principal that I work for, he would come to your house, tell you, I'm coming to get you every day. I'm sending a staff member to come pick you up and we'll get you home every day. We'll feed you every day. You, you, the, you need to get your education. And so the fact is, is that he wouldn't let you quit on yourself. 
And I've been in the school districts down in South Florida. Kids could get drop out at 16 and there was no, but no, no support, no rooting system for these kids. So that's how we've given up on our future as the far as I see it. So whatever we could do to help children, that should be our biggest investment. Yes. And as long as we're speaking about the spiritual path as it, let's broaden it out to societal spiritual path or co uh, collective spiritual path. And there are a lot of areas right now that we need to really look at. They're being brought to the light. I mean, everywhere. And we really need to look at and, and figure out what works, what doesn't, what needs to be done. And education is one of them. There's numerous other ones, but education is one of them because at this point, it's been so dumbed down that it's really not even serving the kids. But there are, you know, there are things that are happening that are good and should be continued. So we shouldn't just scrap the whole thing. Right. We really need a lot of kids to quit on themselves. That's, that's where, you know, that if I didn't quit on myself, I could see myself going through the cracks yeah. just because of my lifestyle, just because of where I grew up. Yeah. And most of us kind of slipped through the cracks. Some of us eventually got the full education. I didn't get my master's until I was close to 40. Um, and some of the rest of my family never did get theirs. I do have one brother who uh, majored in, in technology, which makes perfect sense. And, <laughs> and he was in technology all of his life. Okay, good. But there were several of us who didn't ever make it through college and yet we're gifted. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, I'm one of 11 children. My parents had together or separately and I'm one of two that has a college degree, but that was my choice. It was my choice. Um, I'm one of four that own a home. That was my choice. But I never predicated my life on what they did. It's what I wanted for me. And it wasn't selfish. It was self-preservation. And I think with a lot of people with ADHD and autism, it is about just trying to preserve or uh, to go through. I'm, 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 no, I'm showing my ADHD and I don't even have ADHD, but to persevere through their shortcomings and persevere through, the, through the, their struggles and their frustrations and realize that this is just this moment. It's not a lifetime. Yes. And that's important for kids with ADHD. Yes. And for all of us. I mean, sure. we can get easily caught up in the moment. We can put huge stresses on ourselves that are not necessary. And what what we need to do, all of us, and that means the entire collective, is sometimes we just need to take a breath and say, <laughs> it's going to be okay. In this moment, in this moment, everything mm -hmm. is okay. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. Lay, let's talk about the three tips that you can give my audience that uh, could help them understand ADHD. Well, if you're working with somebody with ADHD, the number one tip I give for communication is ask a lot of questions. Don't assume anything. Ask a lot of questions. If you want your partner to pick up their socks off the floor. Ask them, did you mean to leave those there? Were you going to wear, wear them again? Let them be an adult. Don't treat them like a child. That's number two. Don't treat them like a child. They are, if they're adults, they're adults. If they're a child, yes, they are a child, but you don't have to overdo it. I mean, mm -hmm. treat them like they actually have some intelligence because they do. Mm -hmm. Find that intelligence and work with it. And they will probably have some areas like most of us that are a little bit stronger or a little bit weaker. That's okay. Everybody does. You know, everyone has their challenges to work with. And the third thing is just to understand, like I've said earlier, about breaking things into steps. And this may actually be something that works for all children and for all people. Mm -hmm. If you, I, I still have to break things into steps. 
So that would be my three is ask questions and then learn how to communicate with your person by being respectful and then look at the steps. I love that. I love that. And also I would say, I would add my one is patience, patience for yourself, for who you're dealing with. And you don't know what they're going through in life. So you don't know if they're on the autism spectrum. They don't, you don't know if they're on the ADHD spectrum. You just don't know if they're having a bad day or a bad life. Just be patient one with yourself and two with everyone else. Yeah. And I always put that one in the respect basket for ourselves yeah. and for everyone else. Yeah, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly, man. I love this conversation. Okay. It's time. Everybody goes through this. Sit back, close your eyes, take a deep breath in and connect your inner child. And what would she say about you and how far you've come? I cannot believe how amazing you are. Look at everything you've done. You're on podcasts. You have your own business. You have your education. You have, wow, look at what you've done. And you never gave up, even though there was a couple times in your world, you almost did. Many. And I, that's why I truly, truly honor you for one, identifying your weaknesses with ADHD and the challenges that you've had, but the things that you've overcome to show that we should not have disposable kids. We should not have disposable adults. We should have understanding, tolerance, and compassion for people. Even when we don't understand them, it doesn't make them bad. And everyone is necessary and everyone has a purpose. Absolutely. I so love that. And it's so important because we've come such a disposable society in our, in our, in our world and, and we're willing to throw things away instead of being responsible and accountable for ourselves. So that accountability and responsibility, I always teach everyone about relationships and the number one relationship you have is with yourself. So if you're good with yourself, guess what? You can be good with everybody and anybody. So even it doesn't matter if you have autism, it doesn't matter if you have ADHD, if you can help them feel safe and accepted and seen. And you can use the SAS acronym for that, safe, accepted and seen. A lot of ADHD individuals, it doesn't matter if they're children or adults, will move mountains for you in their abilities, either working for you or doing their studies. And I think it's true for all people. I agree. Absolutely agree. Lay, I, I thank you, thank you, thank you for coming today and talking about a subject that a lot of people don't want to talk about because we still have these belief systems that says, oh, we can't talk, communicate about this. Let's talk about it. Let's put it out there. Let people know that there's functioning people here that are doing amazing things that have different spectrums in their world or have different challenges or obstacles. And it doesn't make them different. It makes them valuable. Absolutely. So well, thank I, you for having me today and thank you for being brave enough to challenge and trailblaze things that people don't want to talk about. You're welcome. You're welcome. Well, it's been my dream. I've had no voice my entire life. And when I retired last year, it took me 50 days to figure out what podcasts were, interview people and have my first podcast out on the podcast in 50 days. So was I labor laser focused? Yes, I was. I was on a mission. So hang on just a second, Lay. It takes a special kind of individual to dream their dreams or thoughts or ideas and turn it into the reality. And if you have autism or if you're on the ADH spectrum, sometimes connecting those dots is very hard. And we as a society don't connect the dots. We in society don't want to talk about them. We in society would rather just be on our merry way as long as it doesn't affect us. 
lay more. Thank you today. You you stepped past your fears. You stayed the course, and you had the courage to do the follow through through the end, to the end. And I love the fact and honor you for willing to be to talk about it publicly. And that's that's the first step. Let's communicate about it. Lay more. You've championed yourself. Now we know who you've become. Thank you for sharing your ideas, your thoughts, and your dreams with us today of how we can be better people to everyone.